Please be seated. Welcome to the 314th convocation, or 314th year in convocation of that year, of Yale University, the 194th year of Yale Divinity School as a separate unit within Yale University, six years till number 200. The Divinity School embraces Berkeley Divinity School, celebrating its 162nd year and collaborates in close partnership with the Yale Institute of Sacred Music in its 43rd year. Whether you are here in Marquand or watching via live stream on your computer, on behalf of all units on the Quad and Yale University more broadly, we welcome you to this assembly. We began convocation officially with one of the most distinguished lecture series in Yale Divinity School and, forgive a dean for saying this, the most distinguished international lecture series in the field of homiletics, the Beecher Lectures. The Lyman Beecher Lectureship was founded in 1871 by a gift from Henry Sage of Brooklyn, New York as a memorial to Lyman Beecher Lyman Beecher was born here in New Haven, graduated from Yale in 1797, and then did an extra year studying theology at Yale College. A celebrated Presbyterian minister, Lyman Beecher served churches in New York, Litchfield, Connecticut, Boston, and Cincinnati. Today, he is best known for two of his 13 children. Harriet Ward, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and later next door neighbor to another celebrated literary figure in Hartford, one Mark Twain, and the celebrated yet notorious minister of Plymouth Congregational Church in New York, Henry Ward Beecher who delivered the first three of the Beecher Lecture Series. From that point until today, the series has featured and recognized some of the most famous ministers and preachers in the country. Last year, I invited all those who had previously given Beecher Lectures to rise and be recognized, and I don't know if we have any here today, but. Here we go, we have several here today. Please recognize them. We're pleased to welcome into this illustrious group, Alice McKenzie, the George W. and Nell Ayers LeVan Professor of Preaching and Worship the Alt Schuler Distinguished Teaching Professor and the Director of the Center for Preaching Excellence at Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University as our 2015 Beecher Lecturer. Professor McKenzie earned a bachelor's degree at Bryn Mawr, a Master of Divinity from Duke Divinity School, and a PhD in homiletics from Princeton Theological Seminary. After her Master of Divinity, one year later, she was ordained as an elder in the United Methodist Church and has served that body throughout her career. Sir, she served several churches in Pennsylvania and to this day continues to serve churches. From 2013 to today, she has served as preacher in residence for Christ United Methodist Church in Plano, Texas, serving basically as a preaching coach for the staff there. Quite an unusual privilege they have to have such an illustrious instructor. Uh, but in the true spirit of Methodism, she doesn't limit herself to a single church. Uh, <laughs> 
She also uh, sings regularly in the chancel choir and co-teaches a Sunday Bible class with her husband, Murray, who is with us. Murray, would you please stand up? We're here in the, the audience, right here. And, and her son-in-law, Dallas, is also with us today. Dallas, where are you? Would you please, why don't you stand and be recognized? We thank you for coming. She extends her orb well beyond the Metroplex, where she resides, and is a featured preacher, Bible study leader, and teacher in worship services and workshops throughout the country. Some of you may know her through her blogs and postings on various digital sites. But the impact of her work on churches is directly related to her academic career something that couldn't be said for most of us who are academics. Following her doctorate, she began her career as a lecturer at Princeton Theological Seminary for five years, and then moved to Perkins, where she ascended the cursus honorum of faculty ranks, rising from assistant professor until she achieved the rank of endowed shareholder. And there are very good reasons for that ascent. She is the author or co-author of seven books and the editor of another with some rather intriguing titles, Preaching Wisdom, Biblical Wisdom in a Self-Help Society, <laughs> Hear and Be Wise, Becoming a Teacher and Preacher of Wisdom, or Novel Preaching, Fiction Writing Strategies for Sermons, and one that I wish I would have read, what not to say, avoiding the common mistakes that can sink your sermon, which she co-authored with John Holbert. She also put her hand to the writing of a commentary and wrote a commentary on Matthew in the Interpretation Bible series, and I think it is now in its fourth printing. Uh, it's been very successful, very influential. She is the winner of multiple awards and honors, including year serving as the president of the Academy of Homiletics and, most relevant to this occasion, the 2014 Ford Fellowship Award for a research project entitled Making a Scene in the Pulpit, the theme of her lectures this year. At the appropriate time, we will invite Professor McKinsey to deliver the first of these addresses. She'll deliver the second tomorrow, the third Friday, there will be a chance for questions and answers on the third day, as is our custom. Uh, but today, after we recess, you will all be invited to a reception in the common room where you'll have a chance to meet uh, Professor McKinsey and visit with one another. Without any further ado, let us now turn to God in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of another day. We thank you, God, for the gift of traveling mercies that brought our family here to this place, whether they came by train, planes, automobiles, or by foot. We thank you, O oh God, even for the rest of last night, for the work that is to be done today and this week. And God, as we gather in this space to learn more of you, to hear of the wisdom and the creativity you have given one of your servants, we ask you, God, that you would let your spirit fall in this place. We pray, O oh God, that as she ascends this pulpit, this desk to speak what you have given her, that you would strengthen her for what she has to say. 
and that you would open up our ears and our critical minds and our hearts to receive something new of you. We thank you for the ministry in this room, for the scholarship in this room, for the desire in this room to make a difference in the world. So God, now we turn it all over to you. And our prayer, oh God, is that you would have your way and that everything that is done and said in this space will give you glory. This is our prayer with hope, anticipation, expectation, and thanksgiving. Amen. The reading is from the book of Proverbs, beginning at the eighth chapter. Does not wisdom call? And does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand, beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she calls out, to you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. O oh, simple ones, learn prudence, and acquire knowledge, you who lack it. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. For my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All of the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to the one who understands and right to the one who finds knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than fine jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. The Word of God. It is indeed a privilege to stand here in the august company of faculty and alumni and friends of Yale Divinity School. Dean Sterling, I thank you for the invitation, the honor of this opportunity, and for that great company of preachers who has stood here in years past, grateful for their contribution and to be on the home stomping ground of two of my favorite homiletical colleagues, Dr. Nora Tubbs Tisdale and Dr. Thomas Troger, and to see many of you other colleagues here as well. It is indeed a wonderful welcome. I'm grateful that my husband Murray and son-in-law Dallas could be here, and um, I wanted to, to start by letting you know that these lectures are part of an ongoing project on which I have been at work and actually at play for a number of years. And I look forward to benefiting from your insights in the final question and answer period. And, and here is my promise to you. When you ask that, that question, that profound question that sparks a, an even more profound insight that makes it into my eventual book, I promise that I will give you credit and I will footnote you and I will even spell your name correctly. So this afternoon, seen is the new story, and tomorrow morning, the preacher as scene maker, and the following morning, the scenic sermon. So don't, don't make a scene. These words are usually hissed through somebody's teeth or another, maybe by a mom to a, a toddler at Target, or maybe by a lawyer to her client on the way into the courtroom, just let me do the talking, for God's sake, don't make a scene. 
or maybe you're eating at a restaurant where they jam the tables really close together and you just aren't eavesdropping, but you can't hear, help but overhear what's going on at the next table. What seemed like it started as a romantic dinner seems to have gone awry, and one person says to the other, not here, don't make a scene. And you kind of... <laughs> but you know, at this point in my career as a preacher and as a teacher of preaching and as, as a writer, am I advice to preachers is exactly the opposite. Make a scene. Because when we say, don't make a scene, we're saying, don't drag others into our drama. And I would say, for God's sake, for the sake of the gospel, make a scene in the pulpit. For God's sake, make a scene. And a stage play or film, a scene is a unit of story. It is the action that takes place in one physical setting in continuous time. It has a setting, it has a plot, it has characters, usually some conflict or it's very boring. We like conflict in plays and movies, not so much in our own lives, but it has conflict. And in the hands of a skilled novelist, playwright, or preacher, it has a theme. So if you wouldn't mind a little bit of audience participation, when I go like this, will you respond at least one? So there's the answer, and here's the question. How many points should a sermon have? <laughs> so a scene should have at least one. Theme, not three, not five. So the class was held on the top floor of Stuart Hall at Princeton Theological Seminary. Now you know Stuart Hall. Dark red stone. The interior is dark paneling. The smell of lemon oil consistently layered over lemon oil since 1876. And it was the fall of 1990, and I trudged up the stairs my 12 pound, okay, I promise this is the only time I'm gonna use air quotes in all three of the lectures, my 12 pound portable computer in hand. I was late for class, which happened to be a graduate seminar in the Practical Theology PhD program, and the subject was Old Testament Interpretation for Contemporary Life. It was co-taught by professors Patrick Miller and Thomas Long, who has long since become mentor, friend, and invaluable colleague. And uh, it was a bad day to be late, a bad day to be late. It was the day that we were to sign up for 30-page papers interpreting a genre of Old Testament literature for life today. And it was due in two weeks. By the time the clipboard came around to me, someone had already nabbed the patriarchal narratives. Someone had already purloined the Psalms. Somebody had appropriated apocalyptic, and my friend, somebody had even lapped up the legal codes. <laughs> Which left a lone, unclaimed genre, proverbial wisdom. But of course, we were a budding group of practical theologians. What possible use could we have for proverbial wisdom? A fellow student whose name I will not reveal to protect the guilty, who up until that time I had considered a friend, leaned over to me and said, good luck getting a sermon out of a one-liner, Mackenzie. <laughs> the scene brightened considerably when upon visiting Spear Library immediately after class, I discovered that Proverbs had the shortest bibliography of all the genres. I checked out an armful of books, and I went home, and after I put my children to bed that night, I opened the Bible <sighs> with a long-suffering sigh, remembering the witticism by Will Willman, who once said, reading the book of Proverbs is like, <laughs> like going on a long road trip with your mom. <laughs> <sighs> it is not good to eat too much honey, or to seek honor on top of honor. Like a city breached without walls is one who lacks self-control. Oh, as I read these proverbs, my eye contact is purely random, all right? 
The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold and so a person is tested by being praised. The fear of others lays a snare, but the one who trusts in God rests secure. Sometimes, sometimes there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is death. I read a couple of them to my then seven-year-old daughter, Rebecca, at breakfast the next morning, and she gave a kind of underwhelmed shrug and said, well, that's just what everybody already knows, only in words you can picture. I knew my little girl was a sharp pencil, but that confirmed it. So the sages responsible for coining and collating the book of Proverbs certainly did not follow the advice, don't make a scene. Proverbs are what I call freeze-dried narratives, drawn from the sages' observations of repeated cause and effect patterns in the realms of nature and human relationships, like clouds and wind without rain, so is the one who boasts of a gift never given. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. They are what James Williams calls aphoristic thinking. They draw the reader or hearer into a scene, and then they send her out with it as a sort of ethical flashlight to shine its light on those scenes in life with which she perceives it to be an apt fit in her life. The proverb compels us to look back, hence a well-known definition by the poet and playwright and novelist Miguel de Cervantes. A proverb is a short sentence drawn from long experience containing a truth. It makes us look back. It causes us to look forward to uh, this anonymous definition that a proverb is a winged word, I'm going to have to get to use my wings, outliving the fleeting moment. A winged word outliving the fleeting moment. Its scenes foster chokhmah, wisdom, skill in deciphering life in specific situations. And with my appetite for scenes whetted by proverbs, I could not help but move on to the scenes of Job and Kohelet from the wisdom of the Old Testament. From wily Satan to asinine advice on the ash heap to a whirlwind god. And then, then to the melancholy and yet strangely serene Kohelet. You know, I think he would have slept much better if he had just stayed in his office. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are practiced under the sun. Look, the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. And I thought, I thought the dead who have already died more fortunate than the living who are still alive, but better than both is the one who has not yet been and has not yet seen all the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Don't make a scene. I hardly think so. And then it was on to another sage. If your hand or your foot or your eye causes you to stumble, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Scholar Robert Tannehill calls these focal instances, and they, they cause us to imagine these highly improbable, absurd scenes. And then somehow to, to make the way that we normally think and act seems strange to us. How does he do it? And then it was time to meet Proverbs' first cousin, a longer narrative genre called the parable. Some years ago, I was leading a workshop on the parables for our Perkins Lay School Theology. We were engaged in what I, I thought was a lively and fruitful discussion of everybody's favorite parable, the parable of the dishonest steward from Luke 15. And, and trying to figure out what it was about reminded me of my days as a youth pastor when we used to play greased watermelon rugby. Is that still a thing? I hope not. But this man raised his hand 
uh, just as we were holding the parable up to the light like a jewel and admiring its polyvalence. And, and he was sitting by the door. He was a man of mature years. He had a backpack and he had a notebook and he had a cup of coffee. And he said, well, all I can say, young lady, is that I feel sorry for the original disciples if the parables are as complicated as you are making them. <laughs> and I thought to myself, he thinks I'm young. <laughs> So then I said what every good teacher does say. I said, well, uh, let's take a break, and, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss your insight. But when the break was over, uh, backpack gone, man gone, coffee cup gone, C.H. Dodd in 1935 defined a parable as a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life, arresting the hearer by its vividness or strangeness and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt as to its precise application so as to tease the mind into active thought. Have you noticed in your ministry, as I have in mine, that not everyone likes having their minds teased <laughs> into active thought? Which leads me to strongly suspect that if Jesus had preached three points and a poem, he would have, you know what I'm going to say, lived a lot longer. <laughs> there are times in every discipline, crossroads, at which the disciple has to decide who and the discipline has to decide who and what it will be for the next generation. When the preaching of the gospel, which began with proverbs and aphorisms, climbed up to the Areopagus and met the Greco-Roman world, it decided it needed to be about intellectual persuasion. Scenes were demoted to anecdotes that illustrated points, and the point sermon and its variations became the sermon form of choice, with some notable exceptions until the fourth quarter of the 20th century. And then another crossroads appeared, and preaching had to decide what it would be for the next generation. This reminds me of a scene from the life of Leontine Kelly, the first African-American bishop ordained in the United Methodist Church. It was 1928, and she was eight years old. She was growing up in Cincinnati. She was getting ready for school one morning. She heard a knock at the door. She came down the stairs, and as she did, she could see somebody standing on the front porch, the outline of somebody. She opened the door, and there stood a handsome, imposing woman dressed all in black. Bishop Kelly says she stood there gawking at this imposing woman, who without any words of introduction or greeting demanded, young lady, who do you plan to be? You must be somebody. Well, Bishop Kelly says, I was eight years old. My only plans for the day were to, to be a third grader. Well, I went back to the kitchen where my mother was making breakfast, and I said, Mama, there is somebody at the door. That somebody was Mary McLeod Bethune, African-American educator and political activist. Bethune was the 15th of 17 children of a sharecropping family from South Carolina who began working with her family in the fields at the age of five she was the founder of the Bethune Cookman School for Girls in Daytona Beach, Florida, advisor to the White House on African American educational issues. She had come to town to call on Mr. James Gamble of Procter and Gamble to raise money for her school. Bishop Kelly's father was the pastor of Calvary Methodist Episcopal Church, and she had come to call at the parsonage to get him to help her in his help him to help her in her fundraising efforts. Young lady, who do you plan to be? You must be somebody. Bishop Kelly says she never forgot that question. And it was abrupt and it was direct and it was backed up by a woman of faith and accomplishment. A woman who the more the girl got to know about her, the more of a role model she became. And the question became the central and shaping question of Leontine's life. 
who do you plan to be? In the early 1970s, North American mainline white preaching was pressed to answer that question. Who, what do you plan to be for the next generation? And it decided, now of course the committee didn't meet and take a vote, but it decided rather than being plot driven, rather than being point driven, that it would be plot driven. That it would move from how the human condition is to how the human condition could and should be by the power of God. The movement became the new homiletic and one of its key assumptions was that we preach to people with a narrative competence, people who are in the process of making a coherent narrative out of the events of their lives and who are capable then of connecting that narrative with the stories and themes of our sermons. In 1971, Stephen Kreitz, religion and philosophy professor at Wesleyan University here in Connecticut, wrote an article in which he insisted that the formal quality of experience through time is inherently narrative. Kreitz's idea shaped what came to be called the new homiletic. Now, about the time that Kreitz was writing his article in the early 70s, I was sitting in Bachman Memorial United Methodist Church in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania, the little river town on the Susquehanna where I grew up. And I was, you know, 14, and um, I, I would sit there and I would, I would listen to these three-point sermons and I would think, man, when life is so interesting, you know, why, why, is, preaching, why is preaching so boring? And in fact, I attribute my call to ministry to the moment of adolescent arrogance when, when I actually thought, I'm only 14 years old and I could do better than this. <laughs> At that moment, the heavens opened. I felt the hand of God upon my shoulder and I heard the voice of God say, you think? That was my God on the doorstep moment asking, arrogant adolescent girl, who do you plan to be? <laughs> Rest assured that I have matured, some <laughs> since then, <laughs> and come to realize just how difficult preaching is. I include that, that scene to, to make the point that, you know, we often hear from scripture that pride goeth before a fall, but wait for it, pride goeth before a call. So you gotta keep your guard up. While I was daydreaming in church, Fred Craddock, then a young New Testament scholar and preacher, was writing a critique of modernist propositional preaching called As One Without Authority. And it answered his question, the question, who do you plan to be preaching? And his answer was, oh, don't be somebody who goes on a whitewater rafting trip of biblical interpretation and brings the congregation back a keychain. Be the trail guide and take them along on the trip. And so the narrative preaching that dominated homiletics from, from the early 70s to 2000 came to be called the new homiletic, and it's all about plot. Other voices in the 80s and 90s joined in, other preachers and teachers of preaching, suggesting versions of their whitewater rafting trip. David Buttrick's Moves, Eugene Lowry's Lowry Loop, the classic African-American start low, strike fire, end high of Henry Mitchell and Frank Thomas and others. And Paul Scott Wilson's move from trouble in the text, trouble in the world, to good news in the text and good news in the world. And Patricia Wilson Kastner's model of Ignatian meditation as the model for the sermon's preparation and, and the sermon's plot, where you enter into the story with an intention you ask for the grace of God. You experience the story and you give thanks for the resulting insight. All these plots are variations on the theme of complication resolution. And you know, we have a lot to thank the new homiletic for. For a view of the sermon as a dialogue, not a monologue. For the people as partners in the message and not passive recipients. For the text as activated and not just excavated. But it's not 1971 anymore. 
The statistics have been well publicized and rehearsed regarding the nuns and the duns. A lot of people under 35 are not buying our complication resolution meta narrative anymore. Rather, many people view life as expressed in the title of a macabre series of children's books, at least I think they are, by American author Dan Handler, writing under the name Lemony Snicket, entitled A Series of Unfortunate Incidents. One of his more famous quotes is this, fate is like a strange unpopular restaurant filled with odd little waiters who bring you things that you never ask for and don't usually like. A couple of years ago, I was teaching an elective class to a group of 20-somethings. It was a narrative preaching, and I was trying to get them to break down a focus for a sermon and flesh it out. So I wrote the focus up on the whiteboard. That was, I, when I tell you what it is, you'll be bowled over. Uh, it was based on my uh, research into Matthew 8 and the notion that little faith one, so you have little faith, is not an insult. It's a term of endearment, and our faith can grow, da-da-da-da-da. So here it was. Our faith grows when, in the high gales of life, we turn to Jesus and find that he is present and he is able to help us. Can I get an amen? amen. Not from them. <laughs> no. What do you mean by faith? Well, not everybody's faith grows. Uh, yeah, all right, faith, uh, you know, well, everyone knows what faith is. Let's just move on. Well, what do you mean by the high gales? You know, some people, for some people, that's like algae in their pool. And for other people, you know, it's something like eviction or, or illness. And it's like, yeah, well, okay, I think everyone knows what high gales are. Well, you know, the, how can we assure people of calm seas when there's such danger in the world? And then, Dr. McKenzie, how and why should I trust someone who falls asleep when I need them the most? I'm like, all right, make up your own focus then. <laughs> I felt like turning my parable man's line back on them and saying, well, I feel sorry for the original disciples if faith is as complicated as you all are making it. <laughs> David Lose points out in his Preaching at the Crossroads how the world and our preaching are changing that we preach to postmoderns and secularists and pluralists, each of whom for differing reasons is not buying our meta-narrative. Postmodernists aren't buying our claim that God can be known, and secularists aren't buying our claim that daily life is the arena in which God can be known. And pluralists aren't buying our claim that Christians have a distinctive story of human identity and divine activity in the world. And others aren't buying our meta narrative because they've already bought into a competing story. Among several options offered by Steve Wilkins and Mark Sanford in their recent book, Hidden Worldviews Eight Cultural Stories That Shape Our Lives, are individualism. I am the center of the universe. I assume that's why I was invited as a lecturer today. I meant that as a joke, not as a, glim a glimpse, gl glimpse into my narcissistic reality. I am the center of the universe. Consumerism, I am what I own. Nationalism, my nation under God. And scientific naturalism, only matter matters. Still, others aren't buying our meta narrative because apparently they don't think that we're a very good ad for it. Christians are so joyless. Christians are judgmental. Why should we buy into what you're selling? And maybe it's not, not just that they aren't buying our story with a capital S. Maybe it's that they can't. Maybe they've lost or are losing the narrative competence to connect with the story that was assumed by the new homiletic. In 2015, not everybody agrees that human beings are hardwired to process life through crafting a coherent life story. Although I have to say, on every airplane that I took yesterday, I just asked the person sitting next to me if they thought that was true. <laughs> thought it was a good eye break, uh, icebreaker. I don't, I don't have time to go into that, but it was quite telling. <laughs> but in a, in a recent essay, uh, Galen Strawson, a British analytics philosopher and literary critic, he, he says that, you know, uh, 
some people are diachronics, and they are connecting events and making a coherent narrative, but there are also others who are episodics, who are living from moment to moment in kind of random bursts of attention. Uh, a, a phenomenon that Tom Long picks up in an essay called Out of the Loop, where he says, you know, um, in our, in our high-tech visual culture, maybe people have lost the will and the skill to connect the ensuing scenes of their life to a larger sacred story. So while many people may have lost their knack of panoramic story connecting, uh, and maybe they're suspicious of our tidy meta narratives, people love scenes. People love scenes. That's why movies use trailers. It's why YouTube has three billion video views per day, more than 25 times the audience of the Super Bowl. Every minute, 48 hours of new video is uploaded. That's why even though you can fast forward through commercials, you don't always. And that's why when we look on Facebook and see videos posted by our friends, we yearn to post little vignettes of our own. On the web, just as in life and the Bible, scenes run the gamut from, from touching to terrifying. From, from humorous to horrific. Oh, there's a dog helping a puppy down the stairs. Oh, I want to see that again. <laughs> and there's a man with a scimitar standing next to a man kneeling with his head shrouded in black. Am I going to watch that? Oh, there's a duck stealing a bag of chips from a 7-Eleven. And then there's Nada Aga Sultan bleeding out in the street, in Kargar Street, in the 2009 Iranian election protests in Tehran. So I'm thinking about writing the 2015 version of Stephen Kreitz's 1971 article, The Narrative Quality of Experience, and I'm going to call it The Scenic Quality of Experience. And maybe, you know, maybe before we ever graduate this story, Maybe human existence and experience is fundamentally scenic in form. Maybe we are hardwired to be drawn into scenes. The action that takes place in one physical setting in continuous time before we ever make connections with, with the larger story, the larger sacred story, which is their context. So at Southern Methodist University, where I teach, I've been walking around campus looking in windows of other disciplines, and so far the campus police have not troubled me. <laughs> I've also, um, at times, invited other colleagues to teach in my classes. So last spring, students in my creative sermon design course gathered in the lab at Tamerlan Advertising Institute at Meadows School of the Arts. And the institute director, Professor Carrie LaFerl, tells my students, the goal of a television commercial is to get viewers to invite your product into their life story. She goes on, in the early days of television, advertising was telling you about the product, and now ads show you scenes in which people have a need for the product and hope to connect with you, the viewer. My class on narrative preaching gathers in the preaching lab at Perkins, and our guest speaker is Gretchen Smith, a playwright. She's doing a workshop on scene crafting, and she says this, and half the class are working on the prodigal son, the other half on Jacob wrestling with the man at Peniel. She says, the first thing you've got to remember in a scene is you have to ask the question, what is at stake for the characters? Because if nothing is at stake for the characters, nothing will be at stake for the listener to your sermon. Anthropology professor Ron Wetherington teaches a course called Forensic Anthropology, Stories Told by Bones. And he stands at the front of the lecture hall with a skeleton hanging on a hook. And the class recreates death scenes from autopsy reports. It's probably a popular elective. He says, all right, uh, two bullet wounds to the back of the head from a distance of one to two feet, homicide or suicide? I got permission from the professor of art at Meadows to sit in on a painting class recently. 
there was that cathedral ceiling studio and the smell of paint and students all around with their easels and canvases. During the break, Anna, the graduate student, TA, took me around, showed me the different pictures, and, and she said, um, in each of these scenes, the artist is seeking to direct your eye to something, maybe an apple. So the lines will direct your eye to the apple, and the light will hit the apple. The apple will appear with definition and clarity amid the rest of the contents of the canvas. So the question for the artist is, where is the light in the scene? And finally, from Kevin Hoffaditz, professor of theater at Meadows. He uh, was, was talking with my intro students. I have him come in every semester and critique their performance so that he can kind of be the bad cop. And um, plus, they listen to him, tell him them the same things I've told them, only in different language, and they go, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. So he says this. He says, do not play the end at the beginning as an actor. You need to know the bigger story, but you need to act it one scene at a time. So when Juliet first meets Romeo, there cannot be a veil of sadness over her eyes at her knowledge that in two hours they'll both be dead. Her eyes need to glint with lust and a little love because he is forbidden fruit and he is hot. And then I had the odd thought, perhaps, that I should visit some labs in the hard sciences and see if I can peer through the windows and observe some cellular mitosis and some photosynthesis, some scenes that are so fundamental to our human life that we don't even know they're going on. But I haven't done that yet. So now I could end this, I could end this lecture this morning, this afternoon. No one corrected me. by exhorting all of us to make scenes at the teaching podium, to help people who are heavy on scenes and light on story to make connections in their sermons. Or I could simply end with a scene. So I'm gonna go with B. <laughs> and I have permission to share this scene from my friend, Dr. Rebecca Miles, who is professor of Christian ethics at Perkins School of Theology. She even said that I could elaborate on the scene, but in hearing it, I saw no need. And so uh, I want to say before, before the scene that she is a gifted preacher and a wonderful teacher. She was teaching a graduate seminar in 20th century theology and ethics at Perkins last spring. She lives in Fort Worth and was riding Dallas area rapid transit, DART, from Fort Worth to Dallas to teach her class. She had her, her book that she was going to use as the focus of the discussion on her lap, and her notes spread out on the seat beside her. And she was thinking about, how, how am I going to arrange my session today? Do I want to start out with my lecture on the book and then invite discussion and then break into small groups? Or do I want to have students raise questions and then respond to my lecture? So she's mulling this over. And she looks over to her right, and there's a woman across the aisle. And judging by her appearance and certain sensory cues or clues, Dr. Miles surmised that perhaps this woman was at least down on her luck and possibly homeless. And so, so the woman nods to the book in Dr. Miles' lap. And she says, um, that book looks interesting. W what's it about? Dr. Miles looked down at the copy of Reinhold Niebuhr's The Nature and Destiny of Man. For a moment, she says her mind went completely blank. <laughs> and then she said, well, uh, uh, it's about our creatureliness and our, our um, bondedness in our creatureliness, but yet our capacity within that for, for a degree of self-transcendence. <laughs> it's about how, how we live, uh, in some sense, limited by our involvement in incorruptible and corrupt social structures, and yet how 
even within that, there are liberative possibilities. <laughs> to which the woman responded, oh. <laughs> and turned her face to look out her window at whatever was passing by. Dr. Miles arrived at her class with a new lesson plan. She addressed her students in this way. Today, we begin with this question. How would you convey the meta-narrative of the Christian faith to a homeless woman on the dart train? I think the appropriate response is to cite a proverb. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in setting of silver. And that's what we had today. We thank you. We will have a closing benediction in just a minute. Please allow the faculty to recess and then join us, if you would, for some refreshments and a chance to visit with one another. We'll see you tonight or tomorrow, uh, depending on where you're headed. Let us pray. As we prepare to go from this most holy place, having received the clarion call to proclaim a winged word, a word that stokes and provokes and makes a scene in our communities, in our congregations, and perhaps even in our own lives, knowing that God is always with us. And now, may the grace of God the love of Jesus Christ and the peace of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide henceforth and forevermore. And all those who could said, Amen. Amen.